Professor Schiette. Uh, we are moving now to, to goals of therapy. We assess the blood pressure, but how can you assess how efficient is the change induced uh, by treatment? So her title is Changing the Goal, Time and Target Range. Is it now a realistic treatment target? Thank you very much, George, and uh, also for the invitation to speak on this topic. I think uh, beautiful for me to speak after Neil's presentation, who really laid the foundation for what I will be speaking on, uh, time in target range. So just to give you some background, uh, firstly, the, these are my disclosures. Uh, I wanted to speak a bit on what we have been used to over time for many, many years since clinical trials have started with blood pressure as an outcome variable, primary outcome. Um, so we, were, we are used to most trials using clinic blood pressure as a primary outcome. Um, and that meant you measured blood pressure at the beginning and the end of the trial using a specific protocol. And uh, sometimes blood pressures are measured in the middle, but those ones were not really used for your primary outcome. It's usually percentage change in blood pressure from beginning to end or difference in blood pressure or percentage blood pressure control as your primary outcome. These are the majority of trials with blood pressure and uh, one of the examples is the well-known uh, dietary approaches to stop hypertension, the DASH trial, who in, in 1997 used change in diastolic blood pressure at rest as the primary outcome. Uh, the pros are, of course, why we have blood pressure, you, uh, traditional cl clinic or office blood pressure being used so widely. It's easy, it's a practical, it's affordable. Everybody have a blood pressure device, whether it's always as accurate as people uh, think they are or validated is, is another question. But it's easy to compare blood pressure uh, pro uh, with, with office uh, as a primary outcome with other trials because there's been so many. The cons have been very nicely described in the previous talk. Uh, it's highly variable. Uh, it provides only snapshots. There are so many things that can go wrong. It's actually remarkable that trials using clinic blood pressure have been able to show such very clear outcomes. Um, but it is. It's those snapshots um, of a person's blood pressure. And therefore, we have no idea in terms of the primary outcome what the changes and fluctuations of blood pressure have been uh, in, from be between the start and the end. And uh, the more we've, uh, we attend these meetings, we realize the immense amount of information that's captured with blood pressure. It's not only the, the very second that the blood pressure reading is taken, it actually presents a lot of important information that has pro prognostic value, uh, like blood pressure variability. We know how to do it in research, but it's not really implemented in primary care at all, although it's very strongly um, predicting outcome. So it's not really practical at this stage to, to in, uh, incorporate it in clinical practice. Because of these limitations, out-of-office blood pressures have more and more been implemented as a primary outcome variable in clinical trials. There we now no, don't only have a snapshot, it's several measurements done at the start of the trial and at the end of the trial. Um, and there may be others in the middle, but as primary outcome, it's usually the change in ambulatory blood pressure or the difference in ambulatory blood pressure that's being used. And uh, here is the Creole trial as an example that used as primary endpoint the change in 24-hour ambulatory systolic blood pressure between baseline and six months. Um, there's clear benefits, and I think I don't have to explain much more about that, but it's, of course, uh, as its own pros and cons. Pros are give much better reflection of blood pressure during the day and night based on several readings, depending on the protocol. But it's expensive, we know it's uncomfortable for patients, there's been so many talks on that also already to improve the, the design of these devices, to make it less um, uncomfortable. And um, it's still the, the middle of the trial, it's unknown what's happening there uh, in terms of the primary outcome if you only look at the change from the beginning to the end. Home blood pressure is, a, is another very good alternative uh, outcome, primary outcome variable. And there it's often done before the, uh, for several days, before this, uh, at the start of the trial and at the end of the trial. Um, but it can also be done during the trial, but those are still not often used in terms of the uh, calculation of primary outcome. Change in average home blood pressure or difference in average home blood pressure is used. And this was uh, used in the pathway to uh, trial uh, that used as primary uh, endpoint the average home systolic blood pressure in the morning and the evening in the triplicate, and then you average it. So that's one way of 
reducing the effect of only using snapshots, but having it in the morning and in the evening um, over several days. So that also counters for that variability, and then that's being averaged. The pros are, of course, uh, it gives a much better reflection of these multiple readings several days, and uh, the cons are there's a risk. The patients often take their blood pressures in the wrong way. So there's a risk of inaccurate monitoring or measurement. We know how many GPs don't do it well, or why would a patient do it well? Uh, 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 so sometimes they are much better than GPs in taking their own blood pressure, I'm sure. But nevertheless, uh, there is that risk. Uh, there has to be very good training. And it's often inconvenient for patients. It's, it's interesting and nice at the beginning, but over time it, it, it gets, um, or they forget. So it gets cumbersome. So uh, another recent development that's been used more and more in research, it's not really used in clinical practice, is what, what Renil also mentioned before, it's the time at target blood pressure. So that is the time during the trial when blood pressure was less than a specific target, so let's say it's 140 over 90, or there's another variation, also time in therapeutic range that can be used. So in this case, let's say you have your clinic blood pressures at the start and at the end, but the blood pressures taken during the course of the trial are also used in this calculation. This information is not discarded. So the primary outcome is percentage time at target over the follow-up period using all of these clinic readings. We've recently uh, performed a secondary analysis of a, of a clinical trial uh, where we calculated this time at target. So it's Demonstrated in this slide to, to simplify, it's basically if there are five periods when blood pressures are taken during the course of the trial, it's the time that blood pressure, the blue section in B, uh, that's the proportion of time that was spent in target, a target range or a, a below target during the course of the trial. And uh, it's quite uh, surprising actually how um, good this is in terms of predicting um, uh, the, the outcome as well. There's, there's some other trials, I'll, I'll refer to that in the next slide, but it's stronger uh, than mean blood pressure or blood pressure variability in predicting outcomes. Uh, the long-term profile um, of many blood pressure readings are thus not lost and incorporated in this sort of measure. The challenge, of course, is it's a, it's a research type analysis. It's complex. It's definitely not uh, uh, used in clinical practice or supposed to be used at this stage. And it still rely on snapshot blood pressures in the calculation of time at target. So it's, in this case, at five occasions, the blood pressures taken at five occasions using this calculation. In this um, analysis of data from the SPRINT trial, um, they looked at systolic blood pressure time in target range. So that's the variation of time below target and looked at uh, cardiovascular outcomes. It's nicely shown in this figure. On the one on the left, you can see this is a good example where blood pressure was for a high proportion of time within that specific range, which they made between a systolic between 110 and 130, whereas on the right-hand side, there's a lower proportion of time in target range. So they have shown clearly that um, this higher time in target range uh, significantly associated with major adverse cardiovascular events, even after adjusting for mean systolic blood pressure or systolic blood pressure variability. So it is really something that um, has great promise for use in the future beyond only in research, if we are able to capture this well. There's also the, the, the situation where we can look not only at time at target or time in therapeutic range, but at this a blood pressure load. This is the cumulative blood pressure, the, the amount of blood pressures that's above the uh, target. So in this case, it's just an example, a hypothetical one of a patient blue and a patient red would have the same average blood pressures across the life course, but because of the huge variation of the red patient, they have a much greater blood pressure load. And, and that is uh, associated already with a stronger, uh, stronger associated with cardiovascular outcomes. So that represents the cumulative load, and it also can be calculated by, by that proportion of time spent above target. The major limitation of all of these techniques at this stage is still, as I've mentioned before, it remains to be uh, using sporadic snapshot blood pressures. And one wonders um, if there could be a different way of addressing this by having blood pressures continuously. 
not only at specific times, only five or so, but to have it continuously throughout the trial. Um, and also that would allow, allow much better calculation, for example, at time at target, if you have those blood pressures taken day and night over the course of, let's say, six months. I think this is the great promise that we all see in continuous blood pressure monitoring with cuffless devices where it can be taken without patient awareness day and night for, for weeks and months on end um, and to give you reliable results that you can base um, the final primary outcome of the study on. Using the um, Actia device actually for a patient uh, over 10 days, you can see there the systolic and diastolic blood pressures taken hundreds of these readings taken within 10 days and giving a much better profile of the, uh, of the variation. And also, you know, you can clearly see if a snapshot blood pressure was taken at any time point, it wouldn't really reflect this uh, type of uh, graph that you see here. The benefit uh, of many of these devices and the promise that it holds is that it's usually linked with the app. And uh, therefore, it has the potential to incorporate all these complex calculations such as time at target within the app and therefore perhaps will make it easier to be used in clinical practice. So the doctor don't have to calculate all of this. It's given by the app saying the past 30 days, 40% of time the patient spent blood pressure time at target. They need to be up titrated. So uh, this is the benefit. It's usually linked and uh, therefore it can produce perhaps a professional health report, with the press of a button. So there's lots of potential that we need to realize um, in going forward. Uh, recently, uh, we published a review, including some of these um, statements in Nature Reviews, cardiology, and also made this final sort of um, statement in the end of the, of the paper that these devices and blood, cuffless blood pressure monitoring, they are available everywhere. And um, they have potential for improving hypertension management in, in terms of awareness, just generally the public wearing these devices. Awareness is such a major issue. Uh, also diagnosis control and long-term follow-up. Um, but, and, and if they prove to be accurate and also usable in clinical practice, it can become the cornerstone of future blood pressure monitoring. Um, but we have seen that there has been intense effort by medical engineers to um, get it accurate, and that's not that easy. We've seen uh, many attempts, and therefore we have to uh, keep a close eye on the, uh, on the new validation standards for cuffless monitors and to make sure they're accurate before we can apply it to uh, clinical practice. Uh, I thank you very much, and I also want to leave you with the last slide for the ISH meeting to be held in Kyoto. Uh, later this year, they're still open for abstract submission. We hope to see many of you there as well. Thank you very much.